I'm happy to introduce uh, Shannon Ellis. Uh, she just recently joined the Cognitive Science Department as a new assistant teaching professor. Uh, her background is in the area, she had a PhD in human genetics from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she stayed on there to do a postdoc uh, and worked on gene expression and predictors for gene expression and areas of autism. But along the way, she's become really interested in data science uh, and uh, uh, has a, a MOOC uh, for uh, teaching data science to people who aren't computer scientists, uh, the people who actually really use it. Uh, and, um, and I think that uh, the data science is, you know, it's a, the big buzzword of our time. We have a new data science existing, but we're, we're really you know, just enmeshed in all kinds of data, and that's growing all the time. For me, it's, I think, very important that, that design and cognitive science play a big role in data science, because the data we really care about is about people. And, and the whole purpose of data science is to help people make decisions and understand things. So it has to play a big role for it. So I want to uh, welcome Shannon. Uh, I found out a few things about Shannon to share with you. Uh, one of them is she's uh, uh, very much involved in beach volleyball. Uh, I was told that even in Johns Hopkins, in the midst of big snowstorms, she got up early in the morning and trudged through the snow to be able to play some beach volleyball before. Well, I don't know if they really technically beach volleyball there. But uh, just as for me, one of the big attractions for me at UCSD was a walking distance to a really good surf break. I would not be surprised that one of the attractions to Shannon was uh, maybe better conditions for beach volleyball. But she's going to talk to us today about, about design moves. Uh, to democratize data science education. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That was a great introduction. Um, I have, since I found out about the Design at Large series a year ago, um, been watching them over time in my free time. And so I had an inkling that Jim was going to find out some fact about me. and. Um, Th that's a great one because I really do love beach volleyball. I know it wasn't really beach volleyball, but we were on sand. It was just kind of an ice sheet with sand underneath of it. Um, so that all said, I am really excited to be UC San Diego. I got here about three weeks ago, um, and it seemed perfect timing to talk about um, data science and education. So as that's what I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to spend the first few minutes talking about the definition of data science. And I want to put in the context of what I studied as an undergraduate. So I was a biology undergraduate major. And the definition of biology is literally right there in the name, right? It's the study of life. So when you go take a Bio 101 course at any university, you're likely, and I don't actually know if this is what's used here, you're gonna use the Campbell's biology textbook and you're gonna go through a very similar syllabus as to what's done at each university. And that's really great in many ways because this has been vetted, it's been worked out over time, um, but it doesn't differ that much from place to place. That's not exactly the case in data science. The definition is still being worked out. Um, each data science piece that's written is, it gives a little bit of a different definition. We're still trying to decide whether or not it's a definition, um, if it's a concept, if it's a discipline. We're trying to decide whether we define it by where it came from. Is it defined by the fact that it has components of statistics and computer science, or is it um, outside of that? Um, the thing is, the definition that I like is the scientific process of extracting value from data. Now, you could argue that, that this isn't the best definition because the words data and science are right there in the definition. But I like that it encompasses the fact that there's still this scientific process. We're still talking about asking a question, forming a hypothesis of what we think might happen, and then using the data to answer that question. And the goal is always extracting value. Whether or not you're in academia, where you're trying to learn something new that nobody else has learned before, or do something in a way that's different than how it's been done before using data, or you're in industry and it's literally like revenue is the value that you're increasing at the company. Um, so I like this definition of data science, but I think it's arguable. Um, regardless of the definition we, know, we use, we know that everybody's talking about it. And the reason everybody's talking about it is because without, despite what the definition is, we know that being a data scientist is a good job. And it was rated number one by Glassdoor last year. And the reason it was rated number one is because people as data scientists are making a good wage and they're enjoying what they do to make that wage. So we stepped back and we thought to ourselves, well, what does it require to get a job in data science? If we know it's a good job, how do we help people get there? 
So the barriers that we um, detected as being limitations to getting a job in data science were the fact that it required an expensive computer historically. Um, it required commuting either to the place where the education was or to the place where the job was. That it's required an expensive education. Um, a university education is not free. And lastly, that it requires connections. And this is not exclusive to the field of data science. Connections help you in every field. So our first crack at trying to help um, individuals get a job in data science was um, this Coursera uh, data science specialization. So this was um, a MOOC that was generated not by me, but the group I came from in 2012. And similar to edX, Coursera is a platform where you can put courses up online and for a fraction of the cost of a university education, you can learn something. And in this case, people were learning data science. So I want to put everything I have here in the context of something that I took um, directly from Philip Guo's Design a Large Talk from two years ago. So in his, he was exploring the design space of interactive tools. And on the y-axis here, you have fidelity. So this is how realistic, how similar to a one-on-one -on -one interaction is your learning experience. And then on the x-axis here, you have scale. So obviously these Coursera courses scale, and tons and tons of tens of thousands of people can take them, but they're not really realistic the way one-on-one -on -one tutoring is. And then we have the in-class classroom, which scales a little bit better and is maybe a little less realistic. So in um, Philip Guo's talk, he talked about awesome interactive tools like Python Tutor, and then Coachella, Code Opticon, and Code Pori that um, filled in this design space for interactive tools. And today I'm going to try to start filling in that design space for MOOCs. Talking about the Coursera MOOC, when it first um, rolled out in 2012, um, in the first year there were some 500,000 enrollments. So we knew that interest in data science was high. This was not new to us, um, but these numbers really reflect that. And there have been more than 5 million people that have enrolled since its inception. Um, we know also that enrollments don't really mean completions when it comes to MOOCs. So we're not really just interested. This tells us how interested people are. Um, but these numbers tell us how many people have gone through the specialization. So more than 13,000 people have in, in completed the entire specialization. And more than more tens of thousands have taken each component of it, but not completed the entire thing. And to put that in perspective, there are about 2,500 master's degrees granted in the United States each year for stats or biostats. So a lot of people have taken the data science specialization. The problem was, and we probably could have seen this coming, and a lot of people did, um, in 08, when MOOCs, that's the first time I knew of the term, in 2008, it was the idea that these were going to revolutionize education. And in many ways they have, um, but by 2012 and 2014, we knew from the data, and it was reported by many places, that MOOCs aren't really benefiting individuals who didn't already have access to education. The people that are taking these MOOCs are people who already have, mo in most cases, masters and PhDs. So this was something that made us step back and return to our barriers to getting a job in data science. So we had somewhat taken care of the needs expense of education. The data science specialization is um, only a few thousand dollars. But it was our goal now to really address all of these. And it's the design of that and what we've done and stories along the way that I'm going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about how we minimize computer costs, how we can learn and work from anywhere, um, how we provide free courses, and how we're working to make finding jobs easier for individuals. So our goal in words was we wanted to teach the basics of data science online without a single requirement for any background in computing. We wanted to teach that in about three months, and we wanted to do that at no cost to the learner. Okay, so we have this idea. The first thing we wanted to do was determine what we should call this. So the first name we had was Chromebook Data Science, and probably from the title you know that this is what stuck. I bet you if we all in this room sat together we could come up with a better name, um, but we did sit in a room for a long time and try and come up with a better name and we failed to do so. So Chromebook Data Science stuck and that's what it is. The next thing was um, when we tried to come up with uh, what we should call that aside from Chromebook Data Science, um, the first thing we started calling it was CDS. Anybody in this new room know why that's a problem? All right, well, my partner is an attorney, and he was like, you do know that stands for controlled dangerous substance. So this is an illicit drug, and I was like, no, I didn't know that, so we needed to change that. And so now it's CBDS. So Chromebook Data Science, or CBDS, is the online program we made to teach data science to anybody with, regardless of background. All right, so that was the idea, now we have a name. There were a lot of steps between having a name and an idea and actually having this thing be a reality. So we first wanted to find a partner organization, and then, because we were on a short timeline, we needed to be able to collaboratively develop the course content. We needed a lot of people to work at this and make it not look like a lot of people had worked at this. In doing that, we had a feeling that we'd probably need to develop some new technology, and we did. 
And then um, we needed to design an in-person tutoring program, and I'll talk about that at length. After we had all those pieces, the idea was we would launch the program, teach the stuff, and get, the, get these people jobs. So that's the goal. So I'll step through this. In finding a partner organization, we didn't think that this would really be a hurdle, but it ended up being it. We thought we had this awesome idea um, that we were going to come in, we were going to teach people cool stuff, we were going to do it for free, and we were going to give people computers and pay them along the way. So we went to a local Baltimore City organization, and we pitched this to them. And they were really excited when we were there. And then we left, and then it was like online dating, and they straight ghosted us. <laughs> they didn't return our calls, they didn't return our emails, and so, we, and we had no idea, but you like want to call and find out, but you also can't. So we just stepped back, and we were like, well, what could it be? So then we realized we didn't have actually any content to show them, we just had an idea. Um, we didn't have a website even at that point, so I was like, maybe we should just do that today. So we did that that day. Um, and we realized that in Baltimore City and in many cities, the populations that we were um, targeting are also populations that are targeted throughout their entire lives. They wind up being experiments from the time they start to the time they finish, and they didn't really know whether or not we were trustworthy if we really knew what we were talking about. So, after pitching it to them, we got some of our stuff actually together, and then we pitched it to another organization in Baltimore City, and they were into it, but they didn't think they could get us the volume of learners. So at least we were getting somewhere. Um, the third time was a charm, so we really lucked out with um, getting in contact with YO, or Youth Opportunity, and this is part of HEBCAC, or the Historic East Baltimore Community Action Coalition. And the goal at YO is to take individuals who have dropped out of high school, help them get their GED, and get, get them into jobs. And while that's the main goal, they are so much more than that at Yo, and it has been great to work with them. So we started partnering with them because they have the individuals that we actually wanted to reach out to, and they have the trusting relationship with them that we certainly didn't. So we had the data science expertise, we had the MOOC expertise, we have the education expertise, but they really had the trusting relationships and knew how to work with the individuals that we really wanted to work with. So it's been great working with Yo, and once we had that so sorted out, we had to actually you know, build this stuff. And we wanted to develop this course content. We had 12 courses that we wanted to build, and we had a few months to do it. Here's the timeline. So in February of um, this year, content development started, and this is when we had people get together and say we should build this thing. In April, we met with Yo, so we had the other two um, organizations in between, and we decided in that meeting we were going to launch sometime in May, and there is no way we're getting all 12 courses built before May. So we were definitely building it as the people were going through it. The only way this is at all possible is because we had an awesome team working on things, and I'm going to try and work through this um, as I go through it. But up top, you see all the individuals, and on the side, you see what they worked on. So for content development, we had seven people involved that wrote at least one lesson somewhere in a course in Chromebook Data Science. And the way we kept track of things was on a Trello board. So if anybody is unfamiliar with Trello, um, what you're seeing here is a snapshot. Each one of these was a different course, and each of the lessons was a different card. If you wanted to write that lesson, you stuck your head on that lesson, and that meant you were going to do it. Um, and then you worked your way through these colors until this one was like launch on LeanPub. So this one, green, is I wrote the lesson. And there were a lot of steps in between. So this is how we kept track of everything, and we did this for all 12 courses. And the reason that we were able to do it was organization having lots of people and because we decided to launch this on the LeanPub platform. So edX and Coursera are much more popular platforms for lots of really great reasons, they're great. Um, but LeanPub was great for us because one, they allowed us to use a pay what you want business model and that is like written into their company, it will never change. So we could offer all of these courses online for free to anybody who wanted them. The second thing was it was all plain text based. So for those familiar with Markdown, it's a slightly modified Markdown format that we could use to then generate this pretty um, LeanPub course. So to see what a LeanPub course looks like, um, I'll just walk through. What you have here um, on the left are all the lessons and the quizzes. When you cl click on a lesson, you can scroll through. There's lots of text and images. And we really try to walk the learners through everything they need so we're not assuming any prior knowledge. And then at the end of the lesson, there's always an automated video, and I'll get back to how we created that. You can get the images, or you can take the quiz. And to pass the course, you need to do well on the quiz. You then select multiple choice answers, or at the end of this, you'll see that there are places for um, answers. And what this is, we had people go code, get a uh, um, code, and that code becomes the answer, and they get credit on the quiz if the code's right. There are also exercises, so we link to DataCamp. Um, these are optional and not required for completing the course, but if you want to go get extra practice on DataCamp, and I'll get back to what that is, um, you can do that. So that's what a LeanPub course looks like. Mm. Okay, 
So I mentioned we made automated videos. There are a few reasons why we did this. So we use speech to text. I'll talk about the details of how we made them. <coughs> but this is Jeff Leak, um, who I worked with at um, Hopkins Biostat. And this is him um, making a video for the Coursera classes. And this was time consuming. So he had to stand in front of it until he got it right. And it also took um, a lot of technical equipment. And it was not easy to update. So data science is changing all the time. We know that. And if you take this video and then have to update it three months, six months later, you then need a professor who's very busy to come stand in front of a screen again and either re-record the whole thing or find the place he needs to redo to still make it a cohesive lesson. So those were the primary reasons. Um, time consuming, hard to update. And the third one was maybe a little vain. So we all know that feedback on the internet is not always helpful or necessary. Um, so these are, this is a single comment about uh, Jeff's voice. So this comment is about your presentation and in particular the way you speak. You nearly always start squeezing your voice as a sentence goes on many times with vocal fry near the end. So there were three professors who were the main people who had worked on this, lots of people worked on it. Brian Caffo, Roger Pang, Jeff Leak, and the internet hates Jeff's voice. I, I like in person, I talk to them all the time. I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, but this is not a reason to dislike a course. This is just something that you need to get over. Um, so it's time consuming, hard to update, and now we'll only get complaints about text-to-speech technology and not our own voices. So that's the other reason um, why we wanted to make these automated videos. But we didn't actually have a way yet to make these automated videos. So this is where the new, uh, new technology came in. So thanks to Sean Cross, who is now a graduate student in, uh, in the Cog Sci department, but was working with our group um, at Hopkins, and John Muschelli, who is an assistant scientist in the department, um, they were invaluable. So we had this idea, we want to take images, we want to take plain text, we want to make videos quickly. Um, and this was thanks to um, something called ARI, or the Automated R Instructor, that Sean Cross um, wrote and made for us. And it's super simple. Once you have your AWS Poly credentials, you load the package, this is R code. Um, and then you give it uh, the images and you give it the script that you want it to read and then you get a video out. So this is a way we could make a video automatically for every lesson across all 12 <coughs> courses. So we're talking hundreds of videos and I can update it anytime I find a typo or an actual thing that needs to be changed in the material. Okay, so we have a way to make the automated videos. Um, now the videos are on my computer. I need a way to have them not be on my computer. So I want them on YouTube. So there's an R package for that called Tuber. Um, and then we realized how many pieces there were. We have the lesson, we have the images, we have the videos, we have that for hundreds of lessons, and we also need this to be in the way LeanPub wants it so that I don't get tons of errors when I'm trying to put it all together. So that's where John came in, um, building Didactor. So this is a way to automatically generate your courses and not have all of those errors at the end. So just to make it clear, we have this lesson. So I have to write the plain text that are gonna, um, be, that's gonna be used in this lesson. And I need this video at the end. The images in the lesson are going to be from um, Google Slides. Those same images are going to be what makes up the video. The text from the lesson is going to be used to generate the script, and it's the script plus the images that make the video. Make that video using Ari, embed that video into the end of the lesson um, once it's on YouTube. So those are all the pieces. So this is the like, general workflow of how generating a course would go. So you'd have the didactor package. Then you would start the course. So this would create all the directories that you need in the way LeanPub wants it. And then you would make the lesson. So this would give you a skeleton um, so that you don't have typos that make your quizzes not compile, that lead you to spend hours at the end of a course trying to find them. <coughs> and I did that a lot before we had didactor. Um, then we have check structure, so this, after everything's going, sees if, sees to check, checks to see if you messed anything up. Um, and then there's check course. So check course does a ton of checks, but first, so it makes, it checks to see if you have the same number of images as you have the text, so your video will actually compile. It, text, it checks to see whether or not you have a, made a change since the last time you pushed something to GitHub so that you can update it and push what you need. Um, it makes a lot of checks to see if your course is compiling. There are also functions to get the images from the slides. So I mentioned everything's on Google Slides. Um, create image just pulls them and generates the PNGs that you'll need for your lessons. And then you can create the video, upload it to YouTube, and then log it to make sure you're only doing that when it needs to be done and changes have been made. So Didactor um, really sped up the process for me. I was wasting hours and hours on trying to get this thing together rather than on generating the content, which is what I really wanted to be spending my time on. So between February and May, I was pulling my hair out with this, and then after May, this became a lot easier. And this is what enabled us to generate 12 MOOCs in a matter of months. Um, and I'm just gonna explain briefly what content is covered across these 12 MOOCs. 
So the idea was that we were starting from a baseline of somebody who has a basically a 10th grade reading and math. Um, so we didn't want to assume any prior knowledge beyond that. So the first three courses are really to introduce um, the basic topics. So the first one describes what data science is and has them do their first mini data science project. And that's very directed. Then there's how to use a Chromebook because um, we are showing that this can be done in a browser and on a Chromebook. So we want to orient people to how to use a Chromebook. And then the third course is just Google in the cloud. This is talking about Gmail, Google Hangouts, Google Slides, Google Docs, Google Sheets, and introducing the entire Google suite as you would be using it. The next two courses, I think, are a little unique um, to the way we approach this. We taught data organizing data science before um, we got into anything else technical. So this is talking about file structure and why that matters and how to name files so that um, you can find them later and so that they're organized and how to name things so that they're human readable and machine readable. So we talk all about that and give them a template for how to organize a data science project. We also teach version control before we teach anything else. So from our limited experience, learners don't even know that this is supposed to be difficult if you just like explain this is the way things are done. So our learners, we just taught them Git and GitHub is the way you do data science and then they just interacted with GitHub from there on out. After that were the technical courses. So this is where the skills were really taught. So we taught everything in R. Um, so the first course is introduction to programming and using the R coding language. And then taught data tidying, data visualization, getting data, and data analysis. So clearly as we're doing this quickly, this is just touching the surface of everything. This is to get them the basic skills. This is not going as in depth as any other course would. But it introduces the topics and they've heard the words and they have experience and they know how to do the basics. The last two um, were the soft skills. So we're told all the time and we know that written and oral communication is a really important aspect of data science, but we don't necessarily always teach it explicitly. So this teaches you how to write a data science report, how to give a presentation, um, what matters in those things. And the last one is about how to get a job in data science. What, what, do you, what pieces do you need to apply to a data science job? What would the interview be like? Um, what should your web presence look like? And um, just ideas and we have them work through um, how you would get a job in data science and where to look for jobs. So those are the 12 courses that made up Chromebook Data Science. And they are all available on the LeanPub platform. They all have a zero dollar minimum price and you can buy the whole course set at once. Okay, so returning to this design space of MOOCs, if we're being honest, Chromebook Data Science didn't really move anywhere from the other MOOCs that we talked about, except for the fact that they're free. So maybe they scale to a few more people um, and they're certainly accessible to more swaths of the um, population, but they don't actually we know that the, they don't reach the population we're interested in reaching. So we had to do that um, intentionally. And that's where we get back to that partnership with Yo. So we had, they had identified two learners to go through this for the first time and we have worked with them to design an in-person tutoring program. And we're calling this Chromebook Data Science Plus. So for these individuals that we're helping directly through an organization, we're providing free Chromebooks. Um, providing free online support through Slack so these learners can ask us questions at any time and we do our best to answer honestly within like 30 seconds because we really wanted to get these questions answered no matter when they came in. And I'm a morning person and Abazar who worked on this is a night person so it worked out. Um, we also had in-person office hours. So this was every week meeting with them for an hour and a half twice a week, so three hours per week. And we provided payment to complete the program. So as the learners were making their way through this content, they were getting paid um, for completion. And I know that this is, sounds kind of odd, but this is a program that we had no idea if it would work. And we told them, we were like, this is new. You may never get a job in data science. This is not what people are looking for. Um, we're gonna do our level best because this is gonna be successful if we get you jobs. Um, so because of that, you could be out working somewhere else and making money. So we need to make sure that we're paying you for this time since we don't know if this is gonna be successful. And then also we want to provide job search assistance after they completed everything. So just to recap, Chromebook Data Science, free online courses available to everybody on the internet, and then Chromebook Data Science Plus is the addition of all of the in-person training. Okay, so we have this program. Sorry, I saw people taking pictures. I'll put that back if you need it. Um, so we had people um, signed up. We had this idea, but we didn't really know how long it would take. So we just kind of like pulled three months out of thin air. Um, and then tested that. And we didn't know how much we should pay the learners. And this is where it was really important to have that organization working with them. We wanted to make sure we were paying them enough to make it worth their while if it failed, but also not so much that we were being coercive so that people would be taking this material even if they hated it the entire time. Um, so we worked with Yo to figure out how much to pay the students. 
and we had all those details worked out. We had um, all the pieces, so we launched the program, taught the stuff, and then stuff, and then worked to get the learners the job. Um, the people that were in charge of the in-person tutoring um, were largely Abuzar Hadavan, who's another postdoc in our group, myself, and Jeff Leak. So we were the three there every week working with these learners, um, starting on May 21st. And reminder, Didactor was right before that. Okay, so we're developing content, we're teaching them things, and we have this projected completion at August 31st. And the payments were going to happen at checkpoints. Once they completed courses 0 through 3, they would get their first um, payment. In reality, this took a little longer than we had initially anticipated. Um, and this was for a few reasons. So one, they, so the stuff started getting harder around course four. So it started to take them a little longer. And we knew that that would happen. We had warned them that would happen. So that was fine. Also, there were projects after six, seven, and nine. So those took a while to complete. And also, it was not all on the learners. I had also said that I would um, get the content done. And there was a week in there where I just didn't get it done in time and they were waiting on me. So that was my fault. So I think this could be um, closer to our initial projected timeline, especially once we on our end had everything pulled together. Um, we launched this program on the <coughs> internet for anybody on September 30th. So it was kind of a crazy time um, about a month ago. And when we launched it, since then, there have been, as of this morning, a few over 2,000 people have started the first course on the internet. Um, so we have, I, from like what I look, there's somewhere between like, and this is gonna sound absurd, 80 and 800 people working on this. Um, and we can talk about why it's somewhere between 80 and 800. Okay, so we have this content, we have people working through it. How do we ensure that people are actually learning? So this is something really important to us. Um, the first attempt was to use DataCamp so I mentioned this earlier, DataCamp, for anybody who's not familiar with it, is an awesome online platform that if you're interested in learning R or Python, you can go on, it's very interactive. Their platform looks something like this, where you would have a video that explains the concepts, and then on the left, you would have some information, you'd have some instructions, you'd write your code here, and then you'd run it in the console on their interface. The problem is you can take hints and you can get the answers for everything and get through everything without actually learning. And I know this because I've gone through this stuff and been like, what did I just do? I just got all the credit and all the points and didn't actually, I don't know what I just did. Um, and because one of our learners is, you know, good at getting through stuff when we tell them to complete something. So um, after that, we decided to take a step back and we started using Swirl. So this is also thanks to Sean Cross. So he and Nick Carchetti, who worked on it first, is now at DataCamp. So the ideas are very similar. Um, and then Sean's the current maintainer of Swirl and has made lots of improvements. So. Swirl, when you look at it, it's learning R in R. So for people who aren't familiar with RStudio, this is what it looks like. Running Swirl is super simple. You load the package, you type in the command to start Swirl, the function to start Swirl, you tell it your name, and then you can pick the courses that we've generated. Once you've selected which course you want to do, you can select one of the lessons. So these are coming from the quizzes they have to do. And then they're given prompts. So they're given some information, and they're given a prompt. They do what they're told. And then they're told that they did a really good job. You're really on a roll. And you keep doing this, you work through this iteratively. If you happen to make a mistake, you would get an error, just like you would if you were coding an R. You then realize you needed quotes, you do that, and you continue through. At the end, you get this question whether or not you want credit for this on LeanPub. If you do, you get this code. That code goes in your quiz. So we now have a way to check if people have actually done the coding and gotten through it. On Swirl, you can skip stuff. On this, you can't. So we disabled skipping so we know that people are actually getting through it. So it either forces them to ask a question on the internet or figure, figure it out on their own. And both of those are better than getting through it without learning it. In addition to um, Swirl, we also had projects. So there are three projects. These are optional for individuals who are just taking the courses online, but required for the people that were taking with us directly. So the first one's on data tidying. We give them a data set, we give them some skeleton code, and then they have to get the, the data from how it started to a usable format. Um, and that was the first project. The second one, one part of it for data visualization, we um, gave them this visualization from 538 and the data behind it, and then we asked them to recreate um, that visualization. And this was one of our learners' um, recreations, which I think for somebody who's been coding for two months is pretty darn good. Um, and then the last one was the biggest one, and data analysis. They really had to put everything together in this one. We gave them, a, well, we didn't give them a data set. We gave them a link to tell them to go get the data. They had to get the data, wrangle the data, explore the data, visualize the data, tidy the data, and analyze it, and then create some prettier. So these are all, um, this is all code and output from the people who have gone through this already. Okay, so they finished everything October 5th. 
And then we decided, you know what? They're doing really great and they've done everything, but they still need a little more when it comes to job prep. And we had talked about having a phase after for job prep um, training. So we decided to have a, a week-long intensive where they were with us from nine to five um, every day of the week. And we did lots of things. So the first goal was to get their resumes together, start looking for jobs. Um, the second was we gave them a data set that they had to analyze to then present at the board meeting for HEPCAC. And I'll talk about that more in a second. And they had to start on a project that was all their own. All of the other projects we gave them we're going to look the same for anybody who had taken Chromebook Data Science. We really wanted them to start doing a project that was one of interest to them and um, two, something that was all their own. So we started doing that for eight hours a day for a full week. And in the middle of it, they presented at this board meeting. So students were, the learners were given data. Sorry, I'm not allowed to call them students. I have to call them learners. So if I call them students at all, you guys should all like raise your hands. They're learners. Um, so HEBCAC uh, provided the data and then the Learners were, had to figure out what the data were and start presenting it in some way and we just asked them to create a few basic visualizations and we had them present at this board meeting. So these are people who have never really presented a data science finding and we're now putting them in front of just like this board of really important people and they were super nervous and it was, they did so well. They did really, really well and I may have teared up a little as they presented, um, but they did such a great job. So we had them present the code, not the details of it, just explain what they were doing because this is a room full of, at that point, nobody, people who didn't program. And then we had them present their, their basic visualizations. So these are data from the organization that they were presenting to. And on the x-axis, you see income levels. And on the y-axis, you see number of people. So you can see most of the people that go through Yo are making 5 to $10 an hour. And um, this was made by one of the learners. This is made by the other one. They wanted to dig into it a little deeper and say, how does that break down by job title? So now income's on the y-axis, job title's on the x. And they were showing us that while most people make 5 to $10, the people who make more tend to be laborers, security guards, and warehouse employees. And that's something that you wouldn't have gleaned from that first visualization. So they explained this to the board. The board was blown away. It was a really great meeting. And the learners were um, doing great. And then I left Hopkins a few days after that. So it was just like a sprint to the end, getting all of this content up, having these get through, get through it. It was very, very exciting. Um, and then I left and moved across country. So returning to our design space, Chromebook Data Science Plus is definitely more realistic. We're working with these uh, learners all the time, but it doesn't really scale. There are opportunities to scale, and there are a few of them. So that's the next hurdle. How do we scale this thing up? Well, one is we can do this in more cities than Baltimore City, and that's in the plan. We have people that have been reaching out to us from a number of different places um, where they have the content now, they have at least some idea of how to do it. We're still working it out ourselves, but they have some idea. Um, and also, we recently hired Ashley Johnson. She started the Monday after I left on Friday, and she is awesome and now in charge of um, running the in-person program so that it's not spread across Abazar, um, Jeff, and I. It's um, all in the hands of Ashley, and she has been amazing since then. I chatted with her this morning um, and I learned a few days ago that our learners both just started their new positions this past Monday. I don't know anything beyond that. So the two people that have gone through it are now in six month um, contracts for doing basic data science work. Um, and I couldn't have done it without the team or any of our partners. So LeanPub has been great. They were developing their courses platform as we were developing the content. So we just went back and forth with them on how we wanted things and they fixed things all the time. I even ruined their Canadian Thanksgiving. So with a bug that I found, and I felt really bad about that, but they fixed it right away. Um, HEPCAC, we, they have been an invaluable partnership. And then for technology, Data Camp and RStudio have been great. And our learners do a lot of their meeting with us at the Starbucks in Baltimore. And we, so we want to thank them too. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah.